As powerful and versatile as the BOSI Q200 might be, it is betrayed by a relatively simplistic user interface that is essentially a larger BOSS GE7 with 10 bands and memory locations. And this poses a few usability issues that are the source of some confusion. Let's try and clear this up. Out of the box, the BOSS EQ200 is basically a digital improved version of the old analog GE7. You plug stuff in, you fiddle with the faders, you turn the effect on and off. And if this is all you need from your EQ, then thanks for watching. It's all for now. I'll see you in the next video. But as I demoed in my previous videos about this pedal, namely in the routing options video, link, link, this pedal can be a lot more than that. You can set up the two EQ channels to run in series or in parallel, you can have independent control over both, you have 128 memory locations to save and recall presets, yada yada yada. If you haven't yet, please go watch that video, because I don't want to be repeating myself too much in this video, I just want to try and keep this as short and as, as interesting for you as possible. So please go watch it and then come back if you don't know what I'm talking about already. And on that note, and if you will allow me 10 very quick seconds for a plug, there are affiliate links for the EQ200, both in the description box and the pinned comment, if you want to use them while you're trying to alleviate your gear acquisition syndrome symptoms, I'd be eternally grateful because that would help the channel. I also have another video about how you can configure all of the switching options of your EQ200. Again, link. Go watch it, because at some point I'm going to be fiddling around with foot switches and stuff, and if you, again, don't know what I'm talking about, you might need to follow that first. With all that said, let's dive even deeper into this pedal and see if we can clear up the usability concerns. To make it easier to understand what's going on, I have loaded my looper with some pink, uh, pink noise. Yeah, pink noise. I've hooked it up in stereo into the EQ200, and I've hooked up the EQ200 straight into my audio interface, also in stereo. That way, I can load up a couple of frequency analyzers so that you can not only listen, but also see what's going on in a much easier way. So the out-of-the-box mode for the EQ200 is parallel structure, i.e. both different channels of equalization running in parallel, with length controls, which means that both channels are going to be affected in the same way by whatever you do with the little faders, sliders, thingy. And in this mode, you can either run the pedal in mono, so input A to output A, you can run it in dual mono or stereo, input A to output A, input B to output B, or you can run it in split mono, yeah, which is input A to output A and B. Essentially, in that mode is the same signal that you input into input A, gets split, EQ'd by the both channels and put out to both outputs. When you plug it in for the first time, it's also in man mode, so manual mode. This man mode is the BOSS Series 200 speak for what you see is mostly what you get. More on that in a bit. So in this mode, what you see on the display and what you hear coming out of this pedal is exactly what the sliders are doing. And I mean, what you see mostly because there is no indication of what happens when you touch the level slider. So let's run some pink noise through this and see what happens. So you can see the audio analyzers on the screen and you can see my Boss EQ200 here. And as you'll see, if I start messing around with sliders, you see the effects showing up both on my display and on my audio analyzers. So you'll see all of this, except if I do level. You can obviously see the effects of the level on the audio analyzers, but you cannot see it on the display. This is a bit annoying, but okay, that's what it is. Back to the manual thing. As I said, it's what you see is what you get. So if I do this for my sliders, you see the effect on the display, you see the effect on the audio analyzer. I'm now going to swap to a different memory location. So, memory location number one. And as you can see, what's on the display has nothing to do with the faders. And what you are seeing on the audio analyzers is what is on this display. Uh, I'm now going to 
advanced memory number three once again what is on the faders is not what's on the display but it is what's on the uh, audio analyzer so you can see that on the memories it's whatever is recorded on the memory that's valid but now let me mess around with this a bit okay obviously I've touched all of the faders so now what's active is what's on the faders no longer what's it recorded on, on memory 3 even though we're still on memory 3 I'm going to go up now to memory 4 and this one happens to be completely flat and you can see that on my audio analyzers but if I go back to manual you see that what's now on the display and the audio analyzers is once again what's on the faders. So that's exactly what the manual mode stands for. In the length mode, what you see on the faders is what you're going to get out of the pedal. The other thing that you see is that both the lights for channels A and B are on, right? So this would lead you to believe that both channels are on. Yeah, no that's another misconception. The channels are on because they are on by default but it's not because those lights are on. Those lights the only thing they do is tell you that you are currently editing both channels. Okay let's prove this. I'm going to change the assignment of these two switches. I'm going to make this one the toggle for channel A, this one the toggle for channel B. Okay, that's it. I've also made this foot switch B on the external switch. I've also made it the general on-off switch, so you can see what's going on. And as you can see now, not only do I have the toggle for channel A here and channel B here, I also have status LEDs for each one of the channels. So channels on, channels off, I'm sorry, channels on. Let's run um, pink noise again so you can see everything on the audio analyzers and you can see that it's being affected if I turn my pedal off it goes back to whatever it was in bypass so the input signal if I turn the pedal on you get this and now I can turn off channel A and you see that it's the same thing as if I had gone into bypass what you can all also see is that when I turn on um, when I turn channel A on and off channel B technically is still on but you see in the audio analyzers that the effect is getting to both sides. It doesn't mean that the pedal is only using channel A no, for both signals, no it's using A and B but don't forget that we are in length mode therefore when I toggle channel A the pedal internally toggles channel B on and off. Now let's get to another source of confusion. If I press the channel button I get an indication that I'm in manual mode, right? Yes and no. What happened here is I did not set the pedal to man by pressing this button. What I did was change the function of this display so instead of changing me the shape of my EQ curve, it's now telling me what memory location I'm in. And it does that because it might be useful on a stage situation where you just need to glance at the pedal and see which memory location you're in. Uh, it might be that you are memory 3 and you can't really count the LEDs and the numbers are too small so you just look at the display and you see oh I'm M3. It might even be that you are on M60, M70, and because you don't have all of those LEDs it's sometimes convenient to have this display showing you oh yeah, I'm memory 60. Both this button and the display are there only for information purposes. You can't set anything with them in length mode. You can only configure them to give you information, either memory location or the shape of the active EQ curve. So far, so good. But let's now talk about the unlinked mode. So get there, turn link off, and let's go back. This is where things get really interesting, because I still have two parallel EQ engines, but now I've unlinked the controls, so I can set them up in different ways. And this is the mode that will allow you to, for instance, insert one channel as a pre-gain boost, 
and one channel as a post amp boost. So pre gain boost will give you more gain, after amp boost in the effects loop will give you more volume. And you can control both of these independently. The thing is, this extra flexibility on the pedal comes at the expense of some more introduced complexity in the user interface and a loss of coherence with what you're used to in the other length mode. So let's dive into this one too. And the first bit of complexity comes here on the channel mode button. Now you get channel A and B lighting up independently. So you no longer have A, B because you're no longer editing both of them, you're editing either A or B. This is no longer just an indication of the active channel. This is the button that you have to press when you want to edit either one or the other. So if I click this once, I am editing channel A. Let me show you with visual indications of, of the audio analyzers. So here I'm editing channel A and I can do this. And as you can see, only channel A was affected. And then I can click the button, go to channel B and affect only channel B. Unfortunately, this is going to be the situation where you're really going to miss the moving faders thing. Because as you can see, my channel A is dictated by what I have on the display, but my faders are still in channel B position. And the thing is, when you try to make micro adjustments, for instance, I don't want here this band in the middle to be so aggressive as it is, so I just want to... Oh, yes. The moment you touch any of the faders, they assume the position that they are in right now. So you're going to have to go back and try and find it, and oops, did it again. This is the extremely frustrating bit if you, like me, are constantly touching the wrong faders. So yes, moving faders would have fixed this in a really lovely way. Even more confusing, the man memory location is no longer what you see is what you get. And this makes sense because now you have two channels to get, but you only have one place to see. Mm. So what happens when you do this? Okay, let's try again. I'm going up to memory three, which is doing whatever memory three is doing. And I'm going to, I don't know. I'm just going to make everything flat on channel A. See, I even forgot to press that button. So I've got everything flat on channel A. I'm going to go everything up on channel B. And as you can see, just like in length mode, I am affecting the things that are currently on memory location three, but I'm not saving them. So if I were to recall memory location three, they would go back to what they were. I'm going to go to memory location four what's on the display has nothing to do with what I have on my sliders but it matches what's on the screen and now I'm going to go up to memory man and as you can see they're both flat so it's no longer what's on my sliders or faders that is affecting what's coming out of the pedal in split mode so in unlinked mode man becomes just another memory location that you can edit and save to okay so it's no longer what you see is what you get it's just another memory location the only thing that still works as it did before is the channel button is still telling you you are in man memory location or you are in m1 memory location but let me show you while we're here that the independent channel control act actually works. So I'm going to go back to manual. I'm going to go to channel A and bump all of the sliders up. You can see it on the audio thingy. I'm going to go to channel B, bump all of the sliders down, except for the level. And you can see that again on the audio analyzer. So one went up, the other one went down. If I press the on off switch which is my channel a toggle my channel a goes into bypass mode or comes active again channel b bypass mode channel b active again or both in bypass mode because i've turned off the pedal or i can turn both the channels off turn the pedal on and it's still in bypass activate both channels potentially confusing 
but extremely flexible. But with all of this, there is another misconception that sometimes shows up, which is, can I save my channel A in one memory space and my channel B in another memory space and load both of them up at the same time? No. Each memory location stores both channel A and B at the same time, and you cannot load more than one memory at the same time. So if you want to have a pre-boost and a post-boost or a pre-cut or whatever EQ curves on both channels that are different, what you have to do is tweak your channel A curve or tweak your channel B curve and save them in the same memory location. And say you want to use the situation that I was describing earlier, so you want a boost before your amp and a boost after your amp, you need to save both of them to the same memory and find a way of getting independent control of both of them. This is my preferred method. So channel A on one switch, channel B on another switch, and move my memory switching outside of the pedal. Why am I not picking this foot switch for channel A and B? Even though the letters are already there, right? Because this foot switch does not work in latch mode with this pedal. It works in latch mode, but not with this pedal. So there isn't a situation where I can tell it, this is going to be my channel A, in which that I can press it, stay on, press it, turn it off with the accompanying light. So what would happen is I press to turn on, but the light stays off, press to turn off and the light stays off. So it becomes really difficult to see what is going on. So my preferred method of using this, channel A, channel B, memory up, memory down. Let's demo this. Say you want to use both channels of the EQ200 as a pre-boost for gain and a post boost for level. You would want to insert channel A in before your amp and your channel B in your effects loop. That's kind of what I'm simulating here. I'm using my Copper head drive in preamp mode. So I'm going from my guitar straight into the Boss EQ200 input A. Output A comes into the input of the Copper head drive. So I'm putting my channel A before my Copper head drive. And then my output comes onto the input of channel B and the output of channel B into my cab simulator from two nodes. So whatever I do on channel A will influence the gain from the copperhead drive, whatever I do in channel B will influence the level coming out of the cab M plus, cab sim, etc. So it's in essence a simulation of boost before amp, boost after amp. And now you want to be able to control both boosts independently. The one thing you can't do, if you want to at any point be able to use both boosts at the same time, is you can't save one channel in one memory slot and another channel in another one and load both of them at the same time. That doesn't work. You can only have one memory loaded at any given point in time. So you have two ways to go around this. One of them is to save three memories, one with the pre-boost, one with the post-boost, and one that has both active. Uh, you will see that I'm still using the FS7 to toggle up and down on my memory locations and you can see that I'm still using these two as channel A and channel B in this situation. So this indicates that channel A is active and you can see the curve that I have for channel A and my channel B is not only flat but it's turned off. If I go to memory 4 my channel B now has my little curve and you still can't see the level boost, but hey. But you can see that B is active. A is inactive and it's flat because I turned it off. So this is what I would use. Memory 4 is what I would use if I was to be doing uh, my level boost. I'd be using memory 3 for my gain boost. And I could go down to my memory 2 to do both boosts at the same time. See, channels A and B are both on. And if I come here, channel A has got my gain boost, channel B has got my level boost. And this is one way of doing it. Thing is, it becomes a bit 
cumbersome for me at least because I might be in this situation where I have my level boost on but I want to do my game boost so I have to scroll down to memories put up with a little time delay between them etc if I were to use this situation I would be definitely using a MIDI controller that would allow me to jump straight from M4 to M2 in one click and back to M4 etc my preferred way isn't this one my preferred way would be to come to M2 i.e have both channels saved inside the same preset and ready to go. I will turn both of, them, both of them off, save them turned off to this memory, memory location two in this case, and now I have both channels ready to go with independent control. So I'm playing, if I want a level boost, I press this one. If I want a gain boost, I press this one. If I only want the gain boost, I press this, but etc, etc. You see how it works. Demo. So, to recap, if you are in length control mode, this button, channel, and the screen are merely indicative. So, you press it to find out what memory you're on, especially if you are in one that, is, that doesn't have an LED on. And you press it to see the curve that is being applied to both channels at the same time. If you come to split control mode, then you have to press this button to decide which one of the channels you are editing. So channel A in this case, channel B in this case. You can have independent control over each channel of the EQ200 if you assign the switch function and the mem function to A and B. Uh, as you can see, this turns on channel A, this turns on channel B, we've been over this, and now you can change your memories either by clicking by hand here, or using a foot switch, an external foot switch, or a media controller. You decide whichever is easier for you. I am partial to this one and MIDI control, because obviously in a gigging situation you can't do this. If you just work in the studio, it doesn't really matter. And if you're using the independent AB control, you don't even need an on-off switch, master switch for the full pedal. You can simply turn both of your channels on and off independently. Alternatively, you can also configure one of the switches to be the on-off switch and the other one to change one of the other channels. So you can have one channel that's always on and the other one that's toggleable, if that's a word, etc. So you can configure this in any way you want. Again, go watch the Switching Secrets video. It probably tells you all you need to know. And of course, you can just MIDI the whole thing with the MIDI ports on the side, and it gives you control over all of the switching functions. Not as much as I would like, but that's going to be another video. Anyway, as you can see, this is an extremely powerful pedal. Is it perfect? No, but it's frustratingly close to being so. Here's what I would personally like to see changed in firmware, in case anybody from BOSS is listening. I would like to see a level indication on the display. As you can see, I'm changing level, there's nothing there. Come on guys, this is basic. I would also like to see 
an option to control both the structure, so the parallel and series thing, and the length controls on and off, I would like to see them be assignable on a memory basis. You can already change the function of each foot switch per memory, so it would be really nice to be able to do structure uh, parallel series and even the frequency centers on a per memory basis. And about the sliders thing, in the absence of motorized sliders, which I know we can't have because it would be really expensive to retrofit all of these, I would like to have an option that would allow me to only affect the signal when I move the slider past the point where it was recorded. So imagine this is my curve. I'm going to flatten all of this. So imagine I have this curve like this, but my slider is in the middle of the thing or even on the top side. I would like this curve to stay in the same exact position until my slider actually reaches the point where it was saved. And with that, I would also like to see an overlay, even if it's just markers, of the positions of the sliders, faders, thingies, with regards to the recorded curve. That would go a long way to fixing most of the annoyances when you're adjusting things on the fly. And yes, I would love to see moving faders and a dual display on the Q200 Mark II. Pretty pleased with cherries on top. So well done if you've watched this video this far. I hope that this has been useful in clearing up some of the confusion that's still floating around about the interface with this pedal. If you still have any underlying doubts, please hit me up in the comments and I'll try to respond to you as soon as possible. As usual, huge thanks to my caffeine suppliers. If you want to join them, the link is in the description. And as I've said before, but this time I can say it slower because it's only two of you watching it anyway, there are affiliate links both in the description and the pinned comment. If you want to buy your EQ200 or something else, please use the links. You can help me and help the channel while you're doing that and alleviating the symptoms of your gear acquisition syndrome. And that's it for today. So until my next video, bye.